We'll be starting the session in just a moment. If you have any connection or technical issues, try refreshing your browser first. If this doesn't work, please go to the help desk by clicking sessions on the left or click the people tab on the right and search help desk to send a private message. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to this, our sixth and final week of our Menus of Change Leadership Summit virtual series. I'm Jacqueline Chi, Director of Programs and Special Projects for the Strategic Initiatives Group at the Culinary Institute of America, and I am so thrilled that you've made the time to join us, whether live in our interactive hop-in platform or watching the live stream or on-demand webcast. It has been an incredible series so far with top chefs, leading climate and health experts, and incomparable business leaders joining us from around the world to share the scientific, health, social, and business imperatives for addressing climate change, as well as the insights, best practices, and strategies that will get you there. If you missed any of the previous week's content, you can watch on-demand recordings at menusofchange.org, as well as access the presentations and recipes using the password you received by email as a registered attendee. This week is no exception as we bring you powerhouse presenters spanning the culinary, food waste, public health, food systems transformation, and agricultural addiction realm. As always, we've built this program with you in mind, so we hope that you will actively engage with us and each other through the chat and the poll, as well as the one-on-one -on -one networking feature and options to join us with your audio and video in the expo booths and breakout sessions. In fact, I've got an easy warm-up exercise for you. If you haven't found it already, I encourage you to participate in our first poll this week, asking about food waste management in your operation. And if you've already done that, consider our networking topic for this week, plants versus plant-based meat, and find some thought partners on this topic during the networking break and reception. In addition to these interactive features, our virtual series format has enabled us to expand our reach and bring this program to thousands of food service professionals around the world. The generous support of our sponsors was critical to our offering this virtual edition of Menus of Change tuition free. And we'd like to extend immense gratitude to our platinum sponsor, Kellogg's Away From Home, our gold sponsor, Lando Lakes, our bronze sponsors, Nestle Professional and Oatly, as well as our supporting and corporate sponsors. Normally, we give them all a round of applause at this point, but since that's difficult to do over the internet, I hope that you'll instead visit them in the expo section during the break and reception and share your thanks directly. As you may know by now, attendees who participate in the interactive and networking activities are entered into our weekly giveaways, and anybody who has participated all six weeks will be entered into the raffle for free registration and travel to next year's conference in Hyde Park, New York. And now without further ado, it's my honor to introduce the moderator for our first general session. Mary Sue Milliken is chef owner of Soflo and Borda Grill restaurants and trustee for the James Beard Foundation. And she has assembled a really drool worthy lineup of chefs and change makers for this next session. Hi, Mary Sue. Hi, thank you so much. It's exciting. I'm really excited to be here. You know, I've been cooking in professional kitchens since I was 16, which is a very long time ago. And I went to chef school on the south side of Chicago. And basically, along with plumbers, electricians, you know, auto mechanics. And to my surprise and delight, being a chef has really become a hugely popularized 
profession. And many chefs are so well known and respected and trusted and revered. And with that platform uh, comes some responsibility and, and an opportunity to lead and to leave our industry better than we found it. So in this session, we're going to explore how we chefs can increase our impact and drive change in two areas. First, in diversity, I, achieving gender parity and ending racism in our industry, which, you know, when I started this back in the 70s in chef school, I thought by the time I was 62, we'd be there. Well, we're not, as we know. We're also going to talk about food system transformation and addressing climate change, public health, and social justice. Two small topics, <laughs> but uh, we have a great list of panelists. So um, what we want to do is give you, the audience, a real sense of how to support more people of color, more women in positions of power in our industry, and how to lead and educate with your menus on promoting planetary health, which means you know food that's good for the planet and good for our bodies and accessible to everyone. So we love questions and be sure to get involved in the chat so we kind of know what you're thinking about. And then um, I wanna introduce, introduce all of our panelists who are amazing, incredible people. First from Ghana, Selassie Atadika is the founder and chef of Midunu, a culinary lifestyle company hi, that hi. creates experiences from private dining to themed pop-ups. And um, her path was kind of cutest to come to cooking. She first studied, got a master's in international affairs at Columbia University and spent a decade working for the United Nations before jumping into the kitchen. And um, she's a grad of the CIA and um, are an alum of, I should say, of the CIA. And, you know, she started exploring how food can be a catalyst for social change. So for Selassie, creating a dish is all about cuisine, community, and culture intersecting with the environment and sustainable sustainability and economy. So um, she makes some incredible artisanal chocolates too that are, I'm sure, as delicious as they are gorgeous. Do you have a picture there, Selassie? Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's a box I wish I could share with you. <laughs> ah, we can't see you right this second, but we'll, we'll, you'll, you'll show us at some point, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so the, our second panelist is Kwame Anwachi, also a CIA alumni. He trained at the prestigious restaurants in New York, like Kraft, Per Se, 11 Madison Park. Last year, he won a James Beard Award for the Rising Star Chef and Best New Restaurant from Esquire. Before turning 30, Kwame has op had opened five restaurants, including the groundbreaking Afro-Caribbean restaurant Kith and Kin in Washington, D.C. But most impressive to me, he's the author of this book, Notes from a Young Black Chef, which is a fantastic memoir, I have to say, Kwame, amazing. Um, and Thank you. It be made into a movie too, which is super exciting. And um, my favorite part were the recipes. I mean, I loved it all, but um, I, getting the recipe for your grandmother Gloria's oxtails <laughs> and how to make that uh, jerk paste from scratch, um, I think was fantastic. It's key. So, it's key. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good to have you. And we also have um, incredible chef Michelle Nishan, the founder and CEO of Wholesome Wave, which empowers underserved Americans to make healthier choices by making fruits and vegetables at farmers markets and grocery stores half the price. And Michelle also co-founded the James Beard Foundation's Chef Action Network, which has trained over 400 US chefs in the boot camp for policy and change essentially turning all of us into passionate, engaged advocates that um, can't, that really want to drive change in our industry. So, um, And his latest venture, Wholesome Crave, is a food company selling plant-forward soups made from planet-friendly ingredients, just like his family grew on the farm when he grew, was growing up. And last but not least, Carla Hall. We all know, but she came to food after working as a licensed CPA and also having an international career in modeling. And uh, she went to chef school in Maryland and worked in kitchens in and around DC before launching her own catering company and cookie company and all leading up to becoming fan favorite on Top Chef 
the chew. And Carla is also a care chef and an advocate seeking solutions to poverty, hunger, malnutrition globally, and also fights at home against food deserts with local organizations. So Carla's recently expanded her uh, relationship with the Food Network with, to develop passion projects and create content. I'm very excited to see what you're going to do there. So um, thank you. Here we are, and let's get started. I want to first address the fact that we're in the middle of this crazy pandemic and its disastrous effects on restaurants and food systems, and a kind of coming on the back end of you know the Me Too movement and in the midst of a, a sort of a large uh, uprising and um, you know focus on the Black Lives Matter movement. So the, all these things have magnified these major weaknesses in an already kind of precarious industry, I would say, and kind of exposed, again, the systematic lack of diversity in our industry. And also a lot of us have had, for the first time ever, all these weeks to be at home and kind of thinking about so much. So we've had the chance to really reflect on all the faults and wonder if now is the time that we could really build back better. So I'd really love for each of you to just give us give us a snapshot of where you're at, how the pandemic has affected you and your business and um, how you're doing through the crisis, what opportunities that you see that this moment brings. So I'd love to start with Selassie. Um, yeah, so I'm in, um, I've been in Accra throughout um, and I actually normally do a lot of travel. So it was actually a very interesting moment for me to kind of be here. Um, I've actually dug into my garden. So I've got actually a ridiculous amount of um, things growing in the garden now. Mm. Um, I couldn't find a lot of seeds before. And so I basically had to negotiate with different aunties to get seeds, to get a lot of the local crops growing. Interestingly enough, you can only find seeds from outside of Ghana. So it's actually been a project and really try to bring them together. And maybe, I don't know if the camera is working, I can show you some of the chocolates that we've also been working on. Oh, so. look at them. <laughs> nice. So all different flavors from across the continent. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kwame, tell us a little bit about where you're at right, no, right now. Um, I'm in New York City. You know, during COVID, I came back to the Bronx, uh, the South Bronx where I grew up. It was hit really, really hard. It was one of the hardest hit places in, in the world. Um, and for a long time, it was kind of impossible for them to even get tested and taken care of. There weren't enough ventilators. There weren't enough, you know, beds. Um, so I came and, and fed the community that I grew up in, and I haven't left since then. So mm. I'm in New York. Or, you know, I've pivoted a little bit during this time. I think we all have and um, left the restaurant that I was at to just focus on exactly what I want to do, you know, and, and whatever that next thing is, because I'm not opening a restaurant until we have a vaccine. Um, I can't operate at 50% occupancy. It just doesn't work out um, for us. But I want to have ownership, you know, and if it's something that is reflective of, of Black culture, African culture, Caribbean culture, it needs to be, um, if Black and Brown dollars are going into that, I think it needs to have some ownership stake with um, a, a people of color. So when that was no longer available to me, um, you know, decided to, to step out on my own and, and force my own path and control my own narrative. Very exciting. Um, Carla, let's hear from you. What's going on? So I was really busy prior to COVID. I was about to shoot a couple of shows and so they were shut down. So I got home and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm gonna rest. But then everybody started scrambling for content. So everybody was cooking, they're like, can you do these things? And so that, that was a huge thing about um, uh, filming and doing segments and a lot of it was PR. And so it would take two days to do one 30 minute segment. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, this is not sustainable. And it was really frustrating and, and lots of anxiety. So. I decided to lean into that. So what if I had the right information? What if I had what if I had the right um, tools, the you know, tripods and lights and everything? So I started gradually getting the equipment that I needed and just turned myself into a producer. 
and producing my own content. And that was really what it was about. And so when they came to me, I'm like, oh yeah, I can do overhead. Oh yeah, I can do this straight on, you know, and, and really pivoting and because it's the power of the pivot. And I didn't think that I would have been the, the one to do that, but it's something about like what Kwame said, taking ownership and taking your power back and what you can do. So that's pretty much been that. And then I do recess. I do 10 minutes of recess every day. So there are a lot of chefs who are cooking every day. I'm like, honestly, I don't want to do that. Uh -uh. So what I was doing, I was really focusing on the joy and really lifting people up in a way that I could just do just to move, to physically move. And um, so that's that's what I've been doing. Yeah, it, 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 I love watching your Instagram. It's amazing. Michelle, give us a little uh, snapshot of where you're where you're at right right now. Well, um, you know, si similar to Selassie, I'm very lucky to have a pretty good sized garden in our backyard. I live in Fairfield, Connecticut. We've been um, stewarding that for uh, 15 years now, um, so that that's been uh, um, kind of a lifesaver because I spend so much of my life now in, in Zoom meetings kind of like this. Um, and and it really takes a lot out of you because you want to put your energy into it. You want to be genuine and you want to really make that direct connection that you miss from direct human contact. So the garden is a bonus, Selassie. I'm, I'm sharing that with you. Um, but I, I also have to say that I'm I am uh, relieved to be a, a reformed restaurateur uh, when we were successful in the 2014 Farm Bill getting um, legislation to double SNAP benefits when spent on fruits and vegetables uh, at farmers markets and grocery stores. Wholesome wave started exploding. The lease was up on our restaurant. We decided not to renew it. Uh, I, I was really questioning whether it was a good idea until recently. Um, uh, but, but my heart does break for so many of my dear friends and colleagues, because this is, it's just an impossible environment. Um, it's impossible. I mean, you can pivot and, and some, some have gotten lucky, but it's hard. And then in the context of the work, our work at Wholesome Wave, the way that we double and incentivize people to make these healthier food choices. Um, imagine the SNAP family that runs out of benefits in the middle of the month and they have $2 for dinner for four people and a head of broccoli's $2, so broccoli's not happening. We have to give people an alternative currency that can only be spent on fruits and vegetables. And the, the communities that we serve, communities of color, Pacific Islander, uh, immigrant, refugee communities, are so food insecure, they actually have all, all those comorbidities, the type two diabetes, heart disease, uh, hypertension, the things that are actually hospitalizing and killing people at the highest rates in this COVID environment. So we actually were lucky to uh, have a technology partner that can actually provide people the benefit through a, through a smartphone app so they can order their fruits and vegetables and have them delivered to their house during this time. But it's only happening in like 10% of our communities right now. We we need to scale it up. So so everything is just hurry up, build the plane as you're flying it, go as fast as you can and hope that you're doing right by the people that you're that you're, you know, sworn to engage with. And it, it's been a it's been a real trip. It's really it's a, it's an odd new reality that's ever evolving. So we don't even know know what the next new reality is going to look like. I'm sure, we're all experiencing the same thing, right? That's exciting, actually, and it has been yeah. such a roller coaster. I think it's just for all of us. I mean, every day is just each day. You know, I don't know if I'm going to wake up in a good mood or a bad mood or. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so, so Carla, this pandemic brings these opportunities to address the challenges that face women and minorities in the industry. So tell us, like, what kind of openings do you see for impacting change? Well, I think, um, and this is both personally and professionally, I think the first thing that I see, you know, my dad used to always say, you can never go home again. Like once you leave, you can never go home again. And that means that once you leave home and you see something different, you can't bring your, your old perspective back. And I think that when we're looking at this time of COVID where everybody's changing, 
The one thing that I noticed with all of this social unrest is that for the most part in a community that is, and I'm speaking of the black community, that is very closed and, and distrustful of the systems and rightfully so, we as a whole have started more than ever to speak about a lot of things that have happened to us. And sometimes you would think that people already know those things, mm. but we were talking about them. And so I think from that awareness, we are able to teach people about our cultures and everything. And, and the, the women and the, those minority women who are having restaurants, it's an opportunity to have their food in those restaurants versus what people are telling you to have like the, the homogenous foods, right? As, as Michelle has spoken. Um, so I, I did a cookbook, Carla Hall Soul Food, Every Day in Celebration. Mm. Oh, here's my book. <laughs> so the reason I bring this up, because when we talk about the disparity of who COVID is hitting and we have to eat healthier, my book talks about Every Day and Celebration Foods. This is an opportunity to really showcase our heritage foods that are every day that people, even people within our communities aren't aware of, or they think that that is not our food. And, and you're reaching back to sub-Saharan Africa and getting those grains like millet and fonio and sorghum and all of those grains and bring those into your diet and all of these vegetables and grains. And it's not just um, fried chicken and uh, smothered pork chops. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and I think the other thing in talking more and realizing how we are using our voices and, and I don't know, I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and just say a lot of black people, when we had the protest, we had a lot of our white friends or non-black friends calling us, are you okay? Are you okay? I mean, it was like, I mean, that was what we were talking about amongst us and like, how many calls did you get today? So, and, and it's kind of funny, but the thing is, it's also a wonderful opportunity to share your culture of, of, of conversations that you wouldn't have had and to say to them that you're in a safe space so that I can tell you about myself and, and what it's about and what it's like to be in this position. So when you have a minority woman, uh, a minority business, and they're trying to get loans, hopefully the communication is a little easier and, and, and people are realizing that within the community, we need to see some of every piece of our cultures reflected in our restaurants and in our communities, because all of those restaurants are leaving us and, and, and people are not surviving, but it is important just for the health of our nation to have those restaurants there. And I'm hoping that what people will see is by talking to people and understanding that people have this pain and so and so often we were checking that pain at the door before we went to work and people weren't necessarily tuned into it hopefully now that they are more tuned into it and wanting to rally behind every single community that is needed and and i think what you said about we can't go home anymore we can't go to pre-covid ideas about race and you know pre the civil unrest because it's so it's been so powerful a time and incredible time for for changing everybody's perceptions right so kwame you know as i'm a, a long time advocate of no kid hungry and i feel that the food system has failed our community communities of color incredibly i mean the statistics are staggering one in six white kids one in four latino one in three black kids go to bed hungry at night in the United States. And this lack of access to healthy choices, you know, is definitely so debilitating. So I just wonder, like, have you, what kind of ideas do you have about changing this and how could we all get involved in, in making that change? You're on mute, Kwame. And that sums up my of how we have to change. No, I'm joking. I didn't say much. Um, but <laughs> seriously, I think <laughs> if I had the answer to that, I would be out there, you know, flicking the switch and making it happen right now. I think 
we need to understand that this country is not very far removed from from racism, whether that's systematic or direct. Um, you know, it hasn't been that long since we couldn't eat in restaurants. It hasn't been that long. You know, the last sport was golf integrated in like the 70s. You know, there's like <laughs> there's we're not far from from oppression and we're still being oppressed to this day. You know, if you saw the person, uh, a man was shot six times with three kids in his car two days ago. And then a white um, anti Black Lives Matter person walked past the cops with a rifle and shot into the crowd of the people protesting and killed two people and injured two others. This is happening every single day. So if we're talking about fight, we're already fighting for our lives just by living. People aren't thinking about us or our food ways, I'll tell you that much for sure. So what is the answer to solve this? I don't know. I think the people that are in power that have a platform have to continue to, to push and continue to educate. When I do events, if, if, it's, if I can donate to a charity, I donate directly to the youth. You know, I, I think you, we've missed the boat on a lot of the people that are like my age and up. You know, we've missed the boat that are in, anyone's like 25 and up. We need to invest in our children. We need to invest in black and brown children. We need to invest in the communities. We need to open up these zip codes. We need to um, we need to show them access. We need to <laughs> let them see things. I'm a firm believer. Believer, if you show somebody something, you show them that it's possible, then they know that they can achieve these things. And um, if we don't, if they don't have the same loving playing playing field when they're five years old, they're not going to have it when they're fifty. So I think we just need to invest in our youth, and that's the most important thing that we can do. Sorry, I don't know. Is it, was anybody hear that? That was great. No, I, yes, thank you. And I, I it brings to mind a question about um, social media for me, because I think, um, you know, it's been, it's so powerful now in the way that chefs are using it and what I'm seeing in the chef community, how much, you know, um, it seems powerful to me. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, how can how can chefs get more involved in, you know, promoting and helping the become, you know, a more just place for, for our, I mean, I think everybody wants our country to be doing the right things, but we don't, I just wonder, I know that, you know, in LA there was a, um, a day that everybody, um, supported black businesses and and a couple you know it actually has been coming up more on more often which I think is having an effect <laughs> yeah are you, me? are you talking to me okay yeah, I was just um, curious. yeah social media um, it's powerful it's also dangerous it's a double-edged sword and there's a responsibility within social media especially since this is like an, a bad episode of Black Mirror. Like all we have to do is look at our screens all day long. Like that's it. So people come obsessive with that. People either, you know, everyone has a voice, but then everyone turns into a critic, you know, and then everyone turns in, uh, it's either very, very negative or very, very positive. I see a lot within social media. Um, some people use it just as a business platform and make sure everything they're doing is very professional. Some people use it as a diary. Like I care if you're drinking tea right now. So like, I think, it, it really depends on the person. And I think if you're trying to leverage in, in, in the business aspect, you need to think about everything that you're putting out there because it is the only reflection of you right now. We're not meeting in person. We're not talking in person. Um, we're talking over the phone. We're doing Zoom conferences. So I think it's um, it can be lucrative if you use it um, for that tool. Um, it can be effective if you're using it for activism and it can be damaging if you're using it as um, a diary, I feel like. So I think it, it all depends on what you what you want to do and what your goal is and what your platform is. Um, thank you. Uh, let Selassie, I want to yeah. talk about, I love your ethos about creating food that's planet friendly, nutritious, delicious, accessible. It speaks to a lot of issues around black and minority equitable access to nutritious food. So what are the challenges that you're seeing in Ghana and other parts of Africa that kind of link with what's happening here in the United States and elsewhere? For me, it was, um, it was interesting because it affected me by just freezing me. So I actually was just frozen for a couple of weeks. Um, 
And as I started thinking through everything, I realized that a lot of the issues are actually exactly the same. So when I, I look at uh, Ghana, colonialism is a structure that's been imposed to, colonialism was a structure that extracted only. So imagine we've got all these cash crops that we're producing for somebody else. It leaves in its raw form, you get the minimum for it. And that whole agricultural process has added or taken away all the value of the local crops. So a lot of, um, as I was saying earlier, you know, the seeds that I find in the seed shops, like in the in their agricultural shops, are all imported seeds. Like you cannot find local seeds here. Um, when you look at the fact that we have to sell cash crops at a price that whoever wants to give us gives it to us, and we can't really complain about it. Um, then you use that to buy your own food. Then you realize that you're totally dependent on somebody else to actually stay alive. So um, in terms of Ghana, 16 to 18% of what is in the grocery store is local. So what does that say for the economy? Um, you've got, um, I think a few years ago, it was $1.6 billion was used to import rice to Ghana. We talk about jollof rice and all, you know, so rice and chicken. The rice is coming from Asia. The chicken's coming from Brazil or China. So our national dish is actually not even supporting anybody locally. And so I think those are some of the issues. And as a chef and as other people who are in the, in the food industry, how can we actually go back to some of these local crops which come from here, which do better in this soil, which are tuned to climate change, like the millets and the sorghums, and turn those into delicious dishes, but also into finished products. And how do you start to negotiate the power and say, hey, you know, like with the chocolates, we're producing the chocolates here and you're going to pay a higher price for them here or here these are the spices that we're using and you know i think we need to get a place where we're adding value in africa but also in terms of i think some of the other issues how do we talk about brown and black people being able to get paid for their knowledge i've had so many people asking me for oh these are amazing you know the pl most plant-based continent in the world but they're not willing to pay you for your knowledge uh, we're talking about um, getting ingredients from here and they're not finished here um, and communities here are not being, um, you know, sort of supported for the work and the hard work that they're doing. I think it was only last year that rooibos tea, the communities in uh, Southern Africa are actually going to be getting something for the work of cultivating these crops. So I think um, we need to think about how do we support the communities to keep all of these things alive, the biodiversity alive? How do we make sure there's agro-processing at um, the source of where these ingredients come from? How do we make sure more people that are brown and black can tell their own stories and control their own narratives? And I really think that's how we start to shift and change. And as food people, you know, how do we fit in and plug ourselves into that? Yeah, I, that's so true. The va We've misplaced the value of things so, so drastically. And this whole, I think, disaster has really shined a light on some of the worst things that that have been plaguing our food system. Um, Michelle, you know, one in six Americans work in the food system from farm to table and um, they they take home minimum wage or sub minimum wages. And we're not, you know, especially women and people of color. If, if we were to right all the wrongs and fix it, um, you know, it seems to me that either the food's going to become very expensive, which it, it is in some countries, or, you know, is there another way to kind of get there? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it actually goes through like the whole chain of this conversation that we've been happen having, you know, going back to Selassie's point, you know, colonialism, There, there's a new word that starts with C and ends with ism. It's called capitalism, which is just a legalized form of colonialism, really. It just it's, it's extractive practice. Uh, what what you have is uh, an economy that really relies on on scores and scores and scores of individuals who are making enough to barely subsist, and a handful of individuals that are actually extracting all of the benefit of you know, all of the actors that are there and in between from the multiple middlemen uh, between the farmer who actually harvests the crop and the end consumer who actually buys the product. Um, yeah, it just, it's, it, it, it's a wacky system. Uh, I used to provoke a lot of derision uh, when I would speak on panels and say, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if we just removed shareholders from the food system that, that um, food 
is an absolute human right that good food is uh, is is a human right and a necessity and the foundation of any healthy society and that it it just shouldn't be something that can make a few people a shit ton of money <laughs> you know on the backs of a, a whole bunch of people who aren't making you know a, a, a rusty dime off of it right so uh, you know the it's it, it it really needs the system really needs to be flipped uh, the challenge is how do you get that done? We're, we're in this moment now, and this is where, yeah, I have to be careful in saying that, you know, perhaps uh, for some of these subjects, this moment in time of COVID and the advent of, of just the grotesque uh, injustices that we see in our system of justice, all of these things coming to a head at once might might be enough to actually flip it. But I so, sometimes it's, you know, we we can't help but try to prescribe <laughs> what should be done. I, I remember um, and, you know, all of the talk around living wages and in restaurants and having, you know, um, starting with a minimum living wage and legislating it. I'm not sure that that itself is the answer without taking a look at all of these other pieces in the system. You know, should there, should there be regula regulations around how much money could be made off of food simply by being an investor? Um, th this is a group of people who put money in <laughs> and extract money out and other than putting their money in, which might allow some type of a new technology, which usually ends up in a more processed food to save more money or some kind of mechanization that saves more labor, and then they just get to extract the money out of it. I, I, I don't think that should that that should be the case. When I had dressing room, that was the last restaurant that I had with the late actor Paul Newman. What was cool about Paul is he was very open minded, and I just I had this idea of how do we just feel better about really taking care of all of our workers and not work within the usual realm of the restaurant industry. You know, paying dishwashers and bus people at minimum wage and then as they work their way up you pay you pay people more so what we did was we 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 paid our dishwashers our prep cooks um our our bussers like 200 percent of market wage and as you moved up the ladder it, it actually normalized and if you got to the top of the ladder if you were a production man or a manager or sous chef or a chef de cuisine you're actually getting paid 10 to 15 percent below market and that the the wage difference in people at, at the lot more in paying people at the top end um, um, a little less didn't make up for it financially but but an unintended we we, we just decided to budget that that we would we would make less money or we might even just break even. Um, what surprised us was uh, we also scheduled overtime. We budgeted and scheduled overtime. We we're a theater restaurant. So instead of hiring seasonal help and then laying people off, we just said, listen, you're always going to get 40 hours, but we need you to hopefully opt in that when it's you know theater season, that you're going to opt in for 50 to 55 hours at you know guaranteed overtime. Um, so we, we had dishwashers making like thirty five, forty thousand dollars a year, which was so they didn't take that landscaping job in the summer. They didn't, you know, um, and we we found that our turnover less was less. Our turnover costs were less. Um, you didn't hear the glass racks hitting the floor and the glasses breaking and the customers applauding because something broke, which always gave me a headache, um, you know. It just people clean the meat scraps. It just they took so much more care in what was going on. There was so much less waste, um, and we suspect less pilferage. It's impossible to manage unless you have cameras everywhere. And we've never been that type of employer. Uh, but but we ended up financially doing much better than we thought simply by doing that one thing and expecting to make less. So. It just it was a creative solution. I don't know how to legislate that type of approach, but I, I just think, you know, our, 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 our schools of economics, our business schools, even our culinary institutes really need to take a look at the existing structure and say there's something inherently wrong with this. 
for everybody. And in, in, until we demonstrate by the way that we pay and treat people in, in our system, every single individual that is part of this chain that goes from farm to table and puts really good food in front of somebody who can afford to pay the higher price for it, until we do it, value everybody equally, yeah, our, our, our kimono is not a good one. <laughs> You're so right. And I think, you know, the, I have this this hope of someday, um, you know, getting the, the the leaders elected who are going to really take that farm bill and flip it upside down and subsidize the things that are really we value in this country and that we really need to support. Yeah, um, I, I I think it's it wage laws because like the subsidies are like you know twelve to twenty billion for all these for these big crops. That's not a lot of money if you you spread that. 20 billion out just amongst everybody who's on snap and and you're going to increase their food benefit by like 20 percent you know yeah. it, it really is how do we pay people and and how how do these multinational conglomerates in, in these big companies who small small number of actors who own big parts of the food system you know make a whole lot less <laughs> and still be millionaires and billionaires, yeah. make a whole lot less and pay people a whole lot more. You know, there there's actually trillions of dollars in that transaction, which is why why it's not going anywhere. Well, we have- um, I know we're probably running out of time. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. But I, I do um, want just everybody to give me a really quick answer about how, what are the top takeaway from our conversation today about what can future leaders of our industry, the younger generation who are our audience today, what can they do? One thing they can each do, just jump in. They can, they can read. They can get some knowledge. I mean, that's the most important thing. And uh, vote? I don't expect. Yeah. And vote. Yeah, and vote. And vote. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I think that we can talk to people inside and outside our, our communities. When you look around and look at who your friends are, who you invite over to dinner, make sure that that is really diverse intentionally. I love that idea. Yeah, um, I think I, just, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. It, it, uh, no, go Selassie. Um, I would just say that um, just share your story and share your narrative. And, and um, if you are somebody who... Um, as Carla said, if, if you're around people that look exactly like you, go, go out and, and, and have try to have engagements that look more like the rest of the world. Because when everything looks the same or doesn't reflect the global dynamics, something is wrong. And I, I think I'd, I'd say instead of looking towards your future and measuring success by how much money you make or how many restaurants you open, measure your success by how many of those that are working alongside you are successful as well. I love that. I think that that is a great note to end on. I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you so much, Mary Sue, as well as all of our chefs for sharing your incredible knowledge. Um, and love this in terms of sharing your stories and um, reading, getting to know each other. And also, as you said, Michelle, looking around and seeing how everyone else is doing. So thank you again so much to our chefs. Um, the conversation isn't entirely over. Kwame and Carla will both be continuing the conversation in their Meet the Author booth during our networking break at 11.15 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and at that same time, Joel Gamorin, Dana Gunders, and Maria Loy will also be talking about their books. So be sure to visit them in the expo section. From one set of chefs and restaurants leading for change to another, before we go to our breakout sessions, I wanted to take a moment to highlight our upcoming Worlds of Flavor Festival and Conference, which as with so many other things these days, surprise, surprise, we are moving online. We see an even greater opportunity this year to connect and open virtual doors to kitchens, dine rooms, fields, city streets, food trucks, and night markets with this online virtual edition of Worlds of Flavor Conference. Our theme this year is World Kitchens, World Tables, a celebration of chefs and community. And from November 10th through the 13th, we're bringing the travel, 
the road, the street food vendor, the world-class cooking suite, the wood fire, the culinary garden, the dumpling maker, the spice market, the flavor innovator, all of them to you. You'll get to watch demos and presentations, ask questions, network, interact, meet cookbook authors, participate in cook-alongs, tour world markets, and even pop up on screen alongside our chefs and experts if you want. As with our Menus of Change virtual series, we'll be offering this program to food service operators tuition-free, but space is limited. So visit worldsofflavor.com for more information and to request an invitation to register. Much of those interactive aspects of Worlds of Flavor probably sounded familiar to you, as we hope that you are converts to our interactive and engaging hop-in platform by now. And on that note, we are now going to breakout sessions. You can access them by clicking on the Sessions tab on the left of your screen. We know it's hard to choose just one breakout from the plethora of great content, but we'll be posting recordings of all of the sessions on our website. Some of these sessions include time for audience questions. So take your place at the table by hitting your green share your audio and video button when prompted. Just before we head to breakouts, so let's take a quick peek at how our poll is doing. Uh, the question was, do you measure and track food waste in your operations? And it looks like 65% of you do, which is great. 35% um, don't. We all know that track reducing food waste starts with tracking food waste. So great to see that the majority of you are already measuring and tracking your food waste. Um, and the question, if you measure food, if you do measure food waste in your operations, what percentage of that food is currently being wasted? Uh, it looks like the majority, for the majority of the respondents, they are only wasting one to 25%, which seems pretty great. We've got one person who says they've got, or one respondent who says that they've got, um, they are wasting zero food, which is um, awesome. I think the goal for everybody, um, but it looks like people are pretty on track in terms of reducing and eliminating their food base. All right, looking forward to seeing you all back here for the next general session, where we will be cr crafting the foundations of a next generation food industry. In the meantime, enjoy the breakouts and the interactive networking during the break that follows our breakout sessions.